Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video, 1st of December, so this is my wrap up for non-fiction November uh, in which there are four single word prompts and I read four books against each of those prompts and I happen to have finished a fifth non-fiction work so I'm including that even though it's not uh, Ally 20 prompt. So the four books I read, Mortal Coil, A Short History of Living Longer by uh, David Boyd Haycock and this met the uh, prompt of record, because it's a record of man's striving towards immortality, or if not immortality, at least pushing death further away and living longer lives. And then Tristan Gooley's How to Read Water. And this is the prompt element, because obviously water is a very significant element on the planet Earth. Um, Animal Bodies uh, on Death, Desire and Other Difficulties by Suzanne Roberts who's a poet, but uh, this is a book of essays, uh, although I will challenge that when I talk about it. But anyway, um, I put this to the prompt for secrets because it's really more of a memoir, uh, albeit in, in, sort, of, in uh, sort of fragments and chapters rather than a sort of through narrative. And what could have more secrets, both revealed and, and not revealed, than a personal memoir? And finally, uh, John Gray, philosopher, Straw Dogs, uh, Thoughts on Humans and Other Animals, and this was for the prompt Border, because of the nature of Gray's argument about man's uh, animalistic soul and animalistic nature. Um, so that was that. And then the fifth book I happened to have finished uh, this month was uh, E.M. Tioran, A Short History of Decay. As I say, that doesn't meet any prompt, but it does have uh, tie-ins with John Gray. OK, I have to say that this was a really uh, poor, uh, unrealised potential of non-fiction November. Very disappointing. What I don't know is whether that was just the happenstance of a choice of not very good books or whether it speaks to a more fundamental issue I have, which is, as a writer, I pursue and crave language and form much more than narrative and character. Uh, and as a reader, absolutely those those um, factors. Now, last year, two of the books I read, one was Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is full of a very ebullient language. I mean, it's completely potty, but uh, the language is wonderful. And another book uh, was, um, if I can find it. Oh, I should have prepared this. Hang on a second. And another, as I say, was A uh, Hundred Artist Manifestos for the Futurist to the Stuckists, which, being the nature of manifestos, their clarion calls to action, their iconoclastic tearing down the status quo. So, again, there's sort of a passion to them. And the language is very carefully considered because it's a, a manifesto uh, in order to inspire action. So, um, within my non-fiction, I think I still need language, I need uh, passion, and I need... Uh, language and in uh, four of the, uh, sorry in three of the four books that I read this year that was sadly lacking. So I'm going to start with the Mortal Coil, a short history of living longer. As I say, this is for the prompt record. And to be fair to this book, it does exactly what it says. Uh, it goes through um, sort of periods roughly marked by centuries, examining man's incessant drive to prolong our lives, you know, towards immortality. Um, so it sort of starts off with, uh, you know, the, the sort of under the uh, the iron fist of, of Christian religion, uh, the prevailing uh, sort of wisdom coming out of the Dark Ages and in, into the sort of 15th century was that uh, when Adam and Eve were in paradise before they sinned and ate the apple off the tree, they were immortal. It was that tree or the knowledge of the tree um, that conferred that immortality on them. If it was the knowledge of the tree and yet they weren't allowed to, to eat from the tree, then I don't quite understand how they're supposed to have the knowledge of, of immortality. But anyway, uh, the moment that they sinned and transgressed, uh, they were no longer uh, mortal. That was one of God's punishments, including uh, having to work for a living and the pain of childbirth. Um, There's other uh, punishments and they were cast out of Eden, obviously. And the prevailing belief is that um, if you are pure of heart, 
you will, even though you will, your physical body will die, you will be immortal in heaven, sat on a cloud uh, on the right hand side of God. Um, and that why we die is because uh, our souls are corrupt, uh, corrupted by sin. And that was the sort of prevailing wisdom, uh, very much as I say, under the gauntlet of, of Christian theology. Uh, there were a few exceptions, sort of um, whether they were sort of urban myths or, or, or whether they really were, of one or two individuals who'd lived uh, till over 100. Uh, don't forget, Methuselah lived uh, over 900 years. There's all sorts of, you know, controversy as to, well, how do they, you know, how long were their years? Um, but there, there were certain people around Europe who uh, were, th were sort of reputed to have lived to over 100 in these times and these are used as examples of, of worth striving towards and sort of used as sort of a, a whip to sort of make sure people kept their souls pure and, and not corrupt but the problem with people living over 100 uh, you know in the 14th 15th century is that record keeping was so poor so that if you lived to over 100 years everyone else around you didn't they died off well before you and the record keeping was so patchy that there was confusion as to whether it was the same person that was spotted in the village a hundred years old or whether it was their son, you know, all this sort of kind of stuff. So, th so these were sort of fairly apocryphal, but they held the popular imagination and they, they were sort of beacons to strive towards. So that was a sort of 14th, 15th century. And then we go into the Enlightenment uh, and we have things like alchemy and people have now started to talk about diet, but the problem is is red wine good for preserving health and driving you to an older age or is it actually inimical to it? So it's slightly lost its, its sort of sinful tag but it's not clear to people whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, the alchemists were looking for the philosopher's stone, how to turn um, iron into gold but as part of that uh, sort of thought um, sort of pattern was also a quest for immortality. And this was the time when certain things were ingested like gold. It was very much a chemical uh, approach to sort of improving one's, one's health. Um, so Francis Bacon in this book is, is sort of one of the uh, sort of pioneers of thinking about sort of how to extend the life expectancy. And ironically, his inquiring scientific mind is what did for him in the end caused his premature death because he was on a coach journey during the winter. He jumped off the coach to test a theory that rather than use salt to preserve food, you could pack it in ice. Uh, and in doing so, he contracted pneumonia and died. Uh, so somewhat ironic. Uh, and then we come, you know, we move to the sort of the biological age and Darwin uh, and the, sort of the genetic factors. Uh, we also move to an era of better record keeping, the Industrial Revolution, partly driven by the introduction of censuses, but also the introduction of life insurance as a sort of concept. So people needed better records, so you weren't going to have the problem of people claiming to live over 100 years old in the 15th century, because now you had life insurance paying out on it, and you have proper censuses rather than church parish records. And then on we go into the current age of technology, and things like cryogenics and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's a very serviceable read. It was quite quite an easy read. Uh, so I, this was solid enough, but it was it didn't leap off the page. So I gave it three stars. Now, Tristan Gooley, How to Read Water. So the reason I wanted to read this, I bought this long before I decided, or long before I knew what the prompts were, for non-fiction November, because this is germane to one of my own writing projects, which involves bodies of water. Um, it's not the one I'm currently writing, but it's one I've started, and I've done about 10,000 words on. So I thought this would tie in, and this does cover the bodies of water that are in my book, so from puddles to streams to rock pools to um, uh, ponds, uh, and then this also goes to the sort of tidal waves in the coast and things like that. When it's small scale, when it's puddles and ponds, and he's talking about uh, how you can, you know, sniff out water by the sort of change in the flora and fauna, um, things like that, it's, it's, you know, it's quite engaging. When he goes onto the bigger scale of the tidal stuff, it's very dry, uh, it's quite sciencey, but the problem is 
this guy is an absolute devotee of water. He sails, you know, all around the world. Uh, he takes, uh, he sort of seeks out bodies of water in land, all, the, all this sort of stuff. He's an absolute devotee, so he's, he's serving it up as a mixture of sort of his personal enthusiasm with these sort of slightly science-y tales on, on how, you know, on, on different effects of water, different types of waves, different, all, all this sort of stuff. And it's, it's, it's still dry, you know, it's science-y and dry, but it's also personal and dry. It's it's a very odd effect that it's a, it's became a real slog to read this. As I say, fortunately, the beginning bits are the small scale of ponds and things like that. That was great. But the longer it wore on to bigger bodies of water, the less engaged I was. And it's called How to Read Water. And it's it seems to me it's written for people who want to go and dissect different bodies of water. So they would go to somewhere with this book in hand, or maybe they'd made notes from it and it's on a clipboard, or they'd even sort of, you know, made notes on their phone. But as a reading experience, it was really, really awful. <laughs> you know, and so if you're in the field and you've got this book in hand and you're trying to, you know, follow his instructions as to how to differentiate one type of, you know, flower from another and, and what that signifies, that's great. But to sit and read in the comfort of your home, it just does not work at all. So I'm afraid two and a half stars. And onto animal bodies. So Sam Roberts is a poet, and this starts with a poem, which I assume is hers. Um, let me just check that. Now, you see, it seems to be attributed to somebody called Ilse Kuznets from Holding Albert Einstein's Hand, which is a pity, because the poem is the best thing in this book. And as I say, Suzanne Roberts herself is a poet, so you'd imagine there'd be a certain lyricism to her writing. The book's divided into three parts. The first is on bereavement and death, mainly around her parents. The second is desire. And the third is sort of miscellany. Uh, although really bereavement and death, particularly her, her sort of thoughts about her mother, just permeate this whole, throughout this whole book. So the bereavement stuff is bog standard, what you'd imagine, what you've read a thousand times before. The desire stuff is very odd to me. One of the chapters in, in The Desire is she's getting remarried in uh, sort of late, uh, you know, early middle age or younger than that. But anyway, uh, and the chapter is devoted to the anxieties about dieting in order to get into the dress. And to me, that I suppose that's a form of desire, desire about one's own sort of body form. But surely... The desire is she's remarrying or she's marrying it for the first time in her 30s. There must be huge desire between her and her husband to be. That's much more interesting to read about. But I think she's protecting her husband because he doesn't really get much of a look in here. Whereas her parents are splattered all over it. But I found that very aggravating that the, the desire sections in here were not didn't reveal much about desire. And in the miscellany, we get a couple of chapters where she uses external scales. One is the scale of pollution from the Californian forest fires and how, you know, the different levels of air pollution and smoke inhalation, that type of thing. And the other is uh, the damage wrought by avalanches because she's a very keen skier. And I think one of the jobs she does, apart from a poet, is she's a ski instructor. So these two scales are used to measure against what she's talking about in the, in the two chapters. The one about the avalanches is she and her oldest friend are on a skiing trip and they have a falling out that's been brewing because her friend is a Trump supporter and, and Roberts is obviously more on the liberal side. And it's a slow burning or a slow decaying because they keep sort of tiptoeing around the subject that they bring in politics and they both sort of pull back because they realise it's like sort of toxic to their relationship. Um, and in a way, the scale, the avalanche scale is gratuitous because it doesn't measure, you know, while, tr you know, if you were analysing Trump, yeah, then you can use an avalanche scale. But, you know, this is about two middle-aged women and their relationship. It doesn't, it doesn't bear the weight that the avalanche scale does. And similarly with the, uh, with the smoke inhalation uh, scale, it's about the, the dying of her aged dog, 
which is the one thing that she and her ex-boyfriend or, or husband, the one she had before, her, the guy she goes on to marry, they, they, you know, they sort of have it like sort of visiting rights and, and this sort of slow protracted death of this dog and, and how it sort of reflects their relationship um, and, and all that. But again, it doesn't tie in and it doesn't bear the weight of this this scale of, you know, air pollution from, from catastrophic forest fires in California. This book is very small. This book is personal memoir. It is not, you know, it's called Animal Bodies, which suggests a sort of a thematic or a metaphorical thing. And, and it's far too small and quite honestly petty. And a surprising, the, the scale that she's operating on, as I say, has a surprising lack of um, lyricism. So there are these sort of big themes that she tries to impose on it, such as these scales, and that's fine. I don't think it works, but no, I'm in trying. But for a poet, she's surprisingly unlyrical. And as I say, the only lyrical thing is a poem by somebody else that she quotes at the beginning. I mean, this book was just terrible, uh, to my mind. Two stars. And on to Straw Dogs by John Gray. So this posits uh, the notion, which is one I share, about um, mankind is so up himself... Uh, believing himself to be superior to uh, the rest of the animal kingdom because we have things like language, we have things like self-awareness through in our consciousness, all, the, all these sorts of things. And yet we have no greater control over our destiny than the animals do. You know, that we too will die. A lot of what uh, shapes our lives is completely beyond our control, such as the country you're born in, the language you're born into, obviously your health, the parents you're born to and the upbringing. You know, we have no control over that. And that, you know, it's a grave error of judgment to imagine that we are superior, we are in control of our destinies, that we are no, you know, that we ignore our animal heritage uh, by believing ourselves to have left it behind. And that, and that this causes things like wars, the destruction of the planet. Um, he posits that uh, w one day we will wipe ourselves out, be it through disease or war or, or whatever, but planet Earth will still go on until eventually the sun dies and it, and it will just, there will be some other species will, will have the numerical dominance over the Earth. And he, he points to uh, Copernicus, uh, you know, sort of positing that, uh, that the Earth was not the centre of the universe, that the Earth went round the sun. And Darwin, obviously, that mankind, uh, you know, was just sort of a random evolutionary uh, outcome. Uh, and that both of these guys, even though they sort of had revolutionary thoughts that should have reshaped our sense of scale and our status in the cosmos, they were both high bound by religion. And they sort of drew back from taking their theories all the way. So Copernicus obviously had to be very careful, otherwise excommunication and death and you know, look what happened to Galileo. Uh, and Darwin also feared the religious orthodoxy of even his day in the 19th century. To you know, He was very careful with, with how he sort of represented what he was doing, when what they should have both done was diminish man's sort of uh, self-aggrandisement and sense of control over events. I believe in all of that. I have no problem with that. But what I found curious about this book was that there's lots of assertion, particularly in the opening chapter or the introduction, things are asserted. They are not argued. They are not, there's no inference, there's no data. And okay, he's a philosopher, he doesn't necessarily have to provide data, but then you have to provide in, inference and deduction. And there's very little of that on show. I was really surprised. He's asserting these things, and as I happen to agree, the best chapter in here is a quick guide through German philosophers, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Kant, Heidegger, uh, little thumbnail sketches of their philosophy, and that was great. Uh, you know, I was familiar with some of them. Um, that, that was a, an example of where he's actually taking you through a history or a, or a, a trail of philosophy, building on philosophy. That worked, but I felt that the rest of the book was not like that. But... It's kind of hard to decide what I made of this book, really. So I gave it four stars, probably because I agreed the hell out of it. And finally, on to Ian Pura and A Short History of Decay. I started this book much earlier in the year. Um, it's hard going, but I think I think worth it. It's hard going because it is 
aphoristic nihilism or aphoristic pessimism. So I think the way to do this is in short, short chunks. Uh, I didn't quite do it in short chunks. I mean, it took most of the year to read it, but that's because I put it down for long periods and then went back to it and read another chunk. I should have done it in much smaller bites because it is a bit sort of concussive in in its um, in the way it's it's like this. It's assertive. He's not throwing any data at you. He's not throwing any arguments. He's throwing aphorisms drawn from his own personal experience and observation. And it's it's brutal. <laughs> it is you know. Don't read this if you're down. Let me give you an example of some of the language. Sensation of a god turned towards destruction, treading the spheres underfoot, slobbering on the blue of heaven and its constellations, of a frenzied, filthy, unhealthy god, the demiurge ejecting through space, paradise and latrines, cosmogony of delirium tremens, convulsive apotheosis in which gold cons consummates the elements. The creatures hurl themselves towards an archetype of ugliness and sigh for an uh, and sigh for an ideal of deformity. Universe of grimaces, jubilation of the mole, the hyena and the louse. No horizon left except for monsters and vermin. That's us, the human race, by the way. Uh, everything makes for disgust and gangrene. This globe suppurating while the living display their wounds under the beams of that luminous chancre. So, <laughs> quite, it, you know, if you sat down to try and read this in one session, it would be like beating yourself around the head with a hammer. But, you know, I'm interested in nihilism, uh, and as I say, there's a certain uh, affiliation with, with Gray's book. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't read this in, the, in ultimately what turned out to be the best way, which is small chunks, but I still got a lot out of it, four stars. I do have another of his books called um, The Problem of Being Born, so pretty much more of the same, I'd wager. I'm not in a rush to get to it, but I will get to it. So that is, that, that's my... Um, somewhat lame uh, non-fiction November. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to do it again next year or not. I think I, what I'm going to do is just see where I'm at come October if I've got lots of uh, sort of fiction stuff to read or, or, or whatever. Um, so yes, not a great experience. As to what I am going on, you know, thank God for getting back to fiction uh, in December. Um, Bob the Booker uh, introduced us to a read-along no, a readathon, which is called In December, Indie December. So to read books uh, published by uh, indie labels. Um, so what I have chosen for that is Boulder by Eva Baltazar, translated by Julia Sanchez. And this is on uh, the indie press and other stories, I think based in Ireland. I have already read this. I will wrap this up in my uh, next fiction uh, wrap up. Percival Everett, I'm Not Sidney Poitier, which is probably his most famous book, Until the Trees. This was republished, you know, I'm not sure if it ever had been published in the UK, but refl uh, sorry, Influx Press got hold of the rights to uh, uh, Everett's books, and this was the first one that they published, um, so I shall be reading that. Fitzcarraldo, maybe the doyen of, uh, of indie publishers. Uh, I've got three of their books, but this is one that appeals to me most, which is Street of Thieves by Matthias Ennard, translated by... Uh, Charlotte Mandel. Uh, I love Zone. Compass was another novel of his which was pretty good. So I've had this for a long time. I don't know why I haven't got to it sooner. Now's the time, which is sort of Bob's take on in December. Books you've had on your shelf for a long time by indie presses but not got round to for whatever reason. Now's the time. Uh, then Platts. Uh, this is published by an American indie called Inside the Castle. Uh, I follow them on Twitter. I think John Trefay was the founding member of the... But they do publish others. It's not just a, a vanity publishing. They do experimental work. Uh, that's why I follow them on Twitter for some fairly <laughs> experimental related uh, tweets. Uh, so there's that one. And finally, on Carsonet Press, which is a mainly a poetry press based in the UK, this is Rookie, a collection of from Caroline Bird. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get to that, because I normally do 12 poetry collections a year, and I've done 12 this year, I and mean, there's no reason why I couldn't do a 13th. Hopefully not unlucky. Um, so I may get to that, I may not. 
The other projects in December are two books that I've had ongoing, part read for a couple of years now. I'd like to finish at least one of them, if not both. One is James Joyce's Ulysses. The other is this, The Tunnel by William Gass, published by Dalkey Archive Press, who are another indie. So if I did get to this, uh, that would uh, count for my in December. Um, Dalkey Archive Press published books that have gone out of print that they feel should not be allowed to go out of print, such as Ben Marcus's The Age of Wire and String, David Marks's work, that kind of stuff. I hope to get to this. I don't know. It's so dense. Um, and the other uh, project I have is uh, Vertigo by W.G. Sebald, which is a buddy read with Rolls and Zena. Uh, we haven't fixed a timeline for that yet, but hopefully that will be done before Christmas. And there you have it. So thanks very much. Till next time.